I think Devolina, you may start now. Thank you, Jayavidya. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Today's webinar is jointly organized by Department of Economics, Research Cell, Seminar Subcommittee, and IQAC Gurudash College. Today, we are privileged to have with us Dr. Alex M. Thomas, Assistant Professor, Azim Premji University, Bengaluru. He would speak on understanding the Indian economy through fiction. On behalf of the Department of Economics, I extend my warm welcome to Alex. So welcome once more, Alex, to this platform. And before we begin with our talk, I would like to invite our IQSE coordinator, Dr. Gautam Mukherjee, to say a few words. Over to you, Gautam. Thank you, Evelina. My uh, beloved students and other esteemed colleagues present in this webinar, on behalf of the Internal Quality Assurance Cell, I welcome Dr. Alex Thomas. The topic sounds very interesting, understanding Indian economy through fiction. I hope that it will be an intellectually stimulating seminar and it will broaden the intellectual horizon of our students of economics and other related subjects. Under the dynamic leadership of Professor Devarina Biswas, economics department is progressing slowly towards excellence. A few days ago, there was an offline seminar. Professor Koshik Gupta of the University of Calcutta was the resource person. Today, we have another webinar. I wish the webinar all success. Over to Devoli. Thank you, Gautamda, for your encouraging words. Today, our principal madam, uh, Dr. Moshumi Chatterjee, could not be uh, present with us. She had some other prior engagements. So uh, now, but she has uh, welcomed Alex. Uh, I mean, she could not welcome her in person, but she has uh, welcomed Alex. She said uh, that to welcome this, uh, the speaker. And she also wished success of this webinar. So now I would like to invite our student, Onushwa Acharjo. Onushwa is from semester six. Uh, she will introduce the speaker. Over to you, Onushwa. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, my teachers and fellow students. Today, Sir Alex M. Thomas is going to share his valuable knowledge with us. Sir Alex M. Thomas, D.T., Economics at Azim Premji University, Bangalore, India. He studied economics at the universities of Madras, Hyderabad, and Sydney. His research has been published in many journals, including the Economics and Political Weekly, European Journal of History of Economic Thought, History of Economic Ideas, and Journal of Interdisciplinary Economics. His textbook, Microeconomics, an introduction, was published by Cambridge University Press in 2021. He delivered the 14th Dr. M. V. Kurian commemorative lecture at Union Christian College, Ariuva, on Adam Smith at his con contemporary relevance in 2019, and the 29th A.K. Francis Memorial Lecture at St. Bartman's S.D. College, Changan Changana Cheri on History of Economic Thought, Rigorous and Relevant in 2021. He is currently writing a textbook on the history of economic Yes, thank you, Anushua. Now I would uh, request Alex to begin your talk. So over to you, Alex. Uh, thank you so much, Anushua, for that introduction. And uh, thank you so much, Devulina, uh, for inviting me to uh, Gurudas College and for everyone else for the support. Uh, certainly, I mean, when we were talking about uh, what I could talk on, I was thinking of uh, maybe uh, delivering a lecture on the history of economic thought or maybe macroeconomics. But uh, I'm really thankful and grateful to uh, Devolina for pushing me to talk about this particular topic, which is understanding the Indian economy through fiction. Because I had used some elements of uh, fiction in my macroeconomics book, which was published last year. So what I'm going to do in today's presentation is really extract uh, some of the 
excerpts from fiction which were in my book and tried to put it together uh, in a in a sort of systematic uh, more systematic way in one presentation so thank you so much uh, once again for inviting me so let me begin by uh, talking about how i want to situate uh, this presentation and how i'm thinking about fiction uh, within the context of economics uh, and to begin with um, let's just try to think of how knowledge in economics can be cat categorized or classified uh, we can talk about theories there are different kinds of theories in economics there are different kinds of empirical e approaches in economics and there's a third category that i want to highlight today which i'm calling an experiential knowledge right and uh, in general in courses in the classroom in textbooks we often talk about theories we talk about data but there's not enough attention given to experience and even if experience is discussed very often it happens within the classroom or we ask a student to go to the market and try and observe certain features of the market and they come back and report uh, and let me give a more specific example here in macroeconomics we talk about the concept of planned investment or ex ante investment uh, this is a theoretical variable when we are trying to understand an empirical manifestation of it or a statistical or a quantitative manifestation of it we go to the national account statistics database and what we are able to find is gross fixed capital formation in other words what we are getting from the quantitative data is actual investment now we must keep in mind that this planned investment is technically not equal to actual investment however the, the theories of investment help us tell a story make sense of this data that we have actually collected but the third point which is what i want to highlight here is that we are not interested in planned investment in and of itself uh, as individuals as individuals belong to different social groups we are not interested in what is happening to gfcf uh, per se what we are really interested in is you know do we have access to roads do we have access to toilets do we have access to parks or do we have access to good public education and health right so if we think of knowledge in economics as panning theoretical knowledge empirical knowledge and experiential knowledge then it is clear that most of our textbooks and most of our resources have been focused on theoretical understanding and empirical understanding and today i would also argue that uh, there is less importance given to theory and more importance given to a kind of empirical knowledge in economics so through this presentation uh, what i'm trying to highlight and to bring to your notice is how can we try to bring this experiential knowledge in economics to the forefront and just to build on this i want to uh, use these terms concept and context so it's not very different from let's say talking about theory and empirics uh, in a particular way but uh just because i think that uh, it rhymes and it sounds uh, better i'm using concept and context in economics we study various kinds of concepts uh, it could be the idea of concept of competition the concept of equilibrium rationality marginal cost marginal utility various kinds of concepts uh, you would be familiar with but then we have a good understanding of these concepts but then when we think of competition as operating within the indian economy or in the kolkata economy then we suddenly get into some kind of a confusion and the confusion or the trouble is that we know that uh, most of the societies that we live in they are not really competitive so then how do we use these concepts to make sense of our context right? similarly there have been criticisms of the notion of equilibrium uh, by people like john robinson which who argued that this notion of equilibrium that is mostly found is a logical notion it does not incorporate historical time the idea of rationality has been criticized from various quarters uh, not necessarily in from a very contextual sense but even within the theoretical domain for instance there is a very famous paper by amartya sen which is titled rational fools which is a critique of the mainstream notion of rationality 
the idea of marginal cost as a concept is very popular and most of us uh, would study it in our undergraduate and postgraduate courses in economics there have been debates there have been criticisms against these notions as well because marginal cost in let's say that in, within the informal sector in india are informal entrepreneurs using the using marginal cost principles not at all right? the idea of marginal utility again within the indian context are people operating on such notions so when we bring concept and context together there is some uh, kind of a dissonance some kind of a disagreement that is often visible and within a classroom or within the textbook or within the curriculum how are we able to engage with it and resolve it uh, to some degree of satisfaction let me begin by just uh, reiterating some of these points but i also want to introduce you to the idea of critical pedagogy uh, maybe and i should add here that generally pedagogy is something that is discussed uh, mostly within teachers professors etc but i believe that pedagogy has to be something that is discussed and spoken about between teachers and students because ultimately pedagogy relates to both students and teachers and the classroom should be seen as a kind of uh, educational community where we are able to bring in disagreements uh, and we are acknowledging that differences of perspectives might exist and how how are we able to engage with them in some meaningful way so here i'll just make two re uh, book recommendations one is the pedagogy of the oppressed by paulo freire and the other is teaching to transgress by bell hooks and i would strongly recommend the book by hooks because it's much more accessible um, for readers than the freire book and the reason i mentioned them here under critical pedagogy is the following that textbooks certainly don't try to bring this uh, these aspects together usually at least conventional textbooks don't but in the classroom some of us as teachers do try to bring in theoretical understanding empirical knowledge and also try to get students to talk about their experience which might differ from the data that we are getting also or from the theory and then how are we able to resolve them uh, in some meaningful way and within economics one of the ways by which this experience can has been spoken about and brought about is let's say by doing some kind of field work or you ask questions to other people some kind of ethnographic work and then you bring those answers back to the classroom but uh, except for um, i think that there's been very little attempt to actually engage more with literature or fiction if we look at uh, this is just some list of examples of courses that we have we have uh, courses on statistics for economists mathematics for economists now outside the more conventional domain in some universities and colleges you might find courses on economic history economic sociology economic anthropology right? but this is first of all this is very rare these days uh, now even if there are courses on economic sociology and economic anthropology both of them have their own respective methods of trying to document experience right? so in some sense what i try to do in my macroeconomics book and what i'm trying to do here today in this webinar is to bring it together and argue that just like we have statistics for economists and mathematics for economists because this experiential knowledge cannot be found in these domains it is important for us to engage also with literature and with fiction and this can be done alongside let's say courses in sociology and anthropology which are doing it slightly differently so what i'm sort of titling it as is fiction for economists or literature for economists and in a way uh, what when we and of course it depends on the choice of text uh, but the kind of text that i'm going to uh, share with you here today i believe that they are giving us uh, more fact than fiction right although ironically these texts are called fiction uh, and in fact sometimes i do uh, joke that mainstream economics is more fiction than fact right but and now we are going to fiction to get uh, more facts in some sense uh, we can also think of uh, 
what authors of fiction are doing as some kind of abstraction what they're doing is in certain characters they are embodying experience uh, and it is deeply contextual and um, if i were to i mean call it in a different way or use a different kind of set of words i would say that it also provides us with an anthropological experience right? and so within this context i think that uh, I, i'm trying to make the case that it is important that as students of economics we also engage with fiction slash literature to get a better sense of our immediate and local surroundings uh, so this is just a list of uh, some of the texts that i have uh, used in my macroeconomics book um, this extract is taken from the index so um, i'll just let uh, some of you read it and i'll just highlight maybe some of these in the later slides of course what i'm going to do in the subsequent slides is go through about uh, five or six extracts and have a discussion around them right so and the choice of uh, these texts as you might notice i've not tried to go for the i've not tried to engage with literature which has been published in the west because the aim uh, in this case was for us or for readers to get a sense of our, the local surroundings so and most of these authors of fiction are primarily considered to be regional writers uh, so many of them are actually translated into english right that they have been written in different languages and then subsequently translated so let me go to the first extract and how uh, we can try to understand it so there are some themes i've broken down this um, presentation into certain themes and we can engage with it uh, so maybe i'm just thinking that uh, i'll read this out aloud but i would also like you to uh, read along with me this is uh, an extract from hansda sovendra shekar's uh, collection of short stories which are titled the adivasi will not dance and he writes and i quote uh, which great nation displaces thousands of its people from their homes and livelihoods to produce electricity for cities and factories and jobs what jobs an adivasi farmer's job is to farm which other job should he be made to do become a servant in some billionaire's factory built on land that used to belong to the very adivasi just a week earlier couple of things that come up one is that in mainstream economics we think of factors of production we think of land labor capital organization often but the question of ownership of land ownership of capital is extremely important and within the indian context it also becomes important to figure out in some sense have a historical understanding of land ownership and here uh, if some of you might be exposed to um, some of marx's writings one of the terms that might come to your mind is the notion of primitive accumulation and where he is very clear that the possession of land and the ownership of land historically has been an extremely violent process right so as eco economic students how do we situate land how do we understand land which is so central within the indian context and most of economics textbooks again might not focus so much on land in the way that as indians we are able to engage with land because maybe for them it's a uh, it's not a very important matter but in any case i would argue that whether we are talking about canada whether we are talking about australia or whether we are talking about india the question of land ownership is an extremely important one and one that we should engage with in our economics curriculum and the way in which i think fiction is able to talk about these issues because uh, authors of fiction are not constrained by form in a way that uh, an economist is when they have to write a journal article so the way they write a journal article has certain constraints and one cannot express certain moral sentiments or emotions in the way that they right uh, the second is about uh, the notion of preferences in traditional microeconomic theory it begins with the idea of the individual that is rational 
and this individual is uh, independent or this individual's preferences are independent of other individuals preferences right and this is used to talk about theory of price this is used to talk about theory of income distribution and mainstream microeconomics forms a very important role in our economics curriculum and therefore it also has an important role to play in how uh, policy makers who have studied economics think about these issues and i thought that this was an extremely powerful statement by uh, imam uh, who is a tamil writer right? and let me just read this out my characters are not great thinkers or rebels they belong to the land they are laborers there is a constant struggle with land and nature my characters do not even dream even if they dream it is about eating well and when i when we contrast uh, this set of this passage with what we read in microeconomics you know with preferences we want to talk about rationality yes there is a certain mathematics and a logic to this rationality which enables us to talk about certain things but how do we situate this within the larger indian context right how do we situate it within the larger socio economic background yeah in this case whether we are talking about caste or whether we are talking about gender and without bringing the social aspect into microeconomics i believe that at least traditional microeconomics is very cut off from uh, local context and after all it is also the kind of methodological framework that they use is fundamentally a historical and a social right? it's a historical in the sense that it does not allow any role for history but also in this sense that my preferences do not change based on my consumption right so if i consume something and then i feel i don't like it my preferences are already given and fixed in that sense no learning is possible no history becomes possible and individuals within this framework are a social because my preferences are independent of yours and within this kind of a context or within this kind of a framing it's very difficult to situate individuals uh, from the indian context and i think that in any context but particularly here when we think of social norms and very often this is not uh, discussed i think so much at least in traditional microeconomics uh, because there are certain norms in which people behave people function depending on the society that you are in and in a way economics the way it is presented uh, in microeconomics it is said that we have to make a difference between positive economics and normative economics and the idea of positive economics communicates this idea of a universal science that the science of economics uh, enlightens us and gives us insights irrespective of which society that you might be living in but that's not really the case because there are strong social norms there are strong normative considerations within which we have to understand these this positive economics and so even the kind of a distinction that mainstream microeconomists make between positive and normative economics has to be challenged and uh, this is an extract from the short stories by manto um, where so i'll just read this out one month 150 piece of clothing went to the wash to test the dobi my wife said dobi this month 60 items of clothing were washed he he said all right begum sahab you wouldn't lie when my wife paid him for 60 clothes he touched the money to his forehead and headed out my wife stopped him dobi wait there were in 60 pieces of clothing there were 150 here's the rest of your money i was just joking the dobi only said begum sahab you wouldn't lie he touched the rest of the money to his forehead said salam and walked out now the kind of uh, sentiments that capitalist society tries to bring in is one that is built on a very strong sense of exchange a very strong sense of monetary incentive right? and what social norms that we we might use the term culture we might use the term so, so sociology to to talk about it 
but what social norms really does is challenges these kinds of uh, notions of strong traditional notions of rationality that mainstream economists are trying to talk about and trying to say that you know this is how human beings not only behave but also ought to behave so even this idea this for instance would be seen as something like irrationality or something like that and within the language of economics the idea of irrationality somehow has a negative connotation so again as economists how are we able to meaningfully bring in these social norms into our discussion and i would also go as far as arguing that i think traditional uh, mainstream microeconomic theory which is built on neoclassical economics or marginalist economics is fundamentally incapable of accommodating these kinds of uh, contextual details it is able to do it in a limited sense in this uh, in this way that if one is carrying out some kind of quantitative exercise you can talk about these various things and trying to uh, add on to it we all in economics talk about competition a lot now whether one is a mainstream economist or you are a heterodox economist or you are a marxian economist or a post keynesian economist or a feminist economist the idea of competition in some way is central now there might be people who don't who want to argue that we are working under conditions of imperfect competition even if that is the case you need to know some, you need to say something meaningful about the idea of free competition or perfect competition and underlying the idea of competition is our assumption that labor is freely mobile now this assumption is made and then you know we talk about microeconomics and macroeconomics in multiple schools of thought but when we bring it to the indian context uh, how do we make sense of social discrimination first and foremost of course there is discrimination based on gender right but here uh, the discrimination is of a social nature and in particular in this context what uh, this author sky baba is writing about is uh, discrimination based on religion Uh, so this is about a muslim couple who uh, tries to find uh, a flat in a urban neighborhood right so let me just read it out i saw another two let sign nearby i walked towards it hopefully there was something written beneath the words to let i moved closer wondering what it was vegetarians only it said oh god this was direct speech no need for any further information the board simply said get out so when within economics when we are talking about ideas of competition when we are talking about labor mobility whether it is in the microeconomic context or in the macroeconomic context how are we able to bring in social discrimination of various kinds uh, into that discussion whether it's in the textbook or whether it's in the classroom or through some kind of pedagogy i think that it's important we are able to bring together in this way you have various kinds of theories you have various kinds of empirical information and through engaging with literature through engaging with people's experiences we are able to challenge some notions within theory we are also able to better understand empirical measures and even demand maybe newer forms of data within the economics curriculum in india i think that over time unfortunately agricultural economics has uh, sort of receded from importance uh, and but given that most of indians directly or indirectly engage in agriculture i think that it is important that we retain a discussion of agriculture and i would say we should integrate it within our microeconomics and macroeconomics courses now if that is extremely difficult certainly i think uh, within the indian economy course or another course there should be a substantial engagement with agricultural economics so here uh, through this excerpt of fiction what i want to introduce you to is the idea of interlink markets this is first sort of uh, developed by the economist krishna bharadwaj after her even people like amit baduri and pranab bardhan also have engaged with it in but in different ways so this uh, particular the idea of interlink markets is simply the following again we think in terms of markets as being interdependent uh, 
in microeconomics especially there is this idea that markets are able to price information properly uh, there is some notion of efficiency associated with markets but what is not discussed explicitly in traditional microeconomics or mainstream microeconomics is the idea of power and by power i'm talking about how groups of people they could be sellers exercise power over the farm so for krishna bhardwaj in her work on uh, indian agriculture which she where she is inspired by the classical political economy tradition Uh, she argues that uh, within agriculture especially there are groups of people who exercise significant control over uh, the people who are coming to sell their product that is the farmers who are selling their product so the buyers exercise significant control now this extract that i have uh, shared here is taken from uh, kota nilima's book called death of a money lender and in this case what the discussion is really about between a journalist and two senior workers of a textile mill and let me just read this out i could tell you a hundred methods for making sure a mill gets the best cotton at the lowest rates i just have to manage the market agents if the marketing committee official decides that the farmer's cotton is second or third grade i get first grade cotton at third grade prices the farmer could also bribe the right man and get a first grade certification but the farmer usually does not even have the money to pay the transporter who gets the harvest to the market let me just go on or i can locate traders who lend seeds fertilizers pesticides and farm implements to the farmers after pledging their produce i could support the trader and make sure i get the produce at a much lower rate usually at the government's minimum support price it is set as a benchmark to make sure the prices do not fall lower but we know how to use it otherwise don't the farmers complain against you farmers cannot complain they are at the bottom of the rung they cannot complain against market agents because they have to meet them at the time of every harvest how about money lenders the farmers need to be on the best of terms with the money lender for the sake of emergencies and even if the interest rate is 36% per annum they can't protest against the banks either even if they give less than the stipulated uh, crop loan per acre so in this uh, discussion which is taken from nilima's book death of a money lender it becomes sort of clear and some kind of insights into how interlinks market function in reality and of course this kind of an insight one can also get if we have a, let's say uh, an economic anthropology course which explicitly deals with or engages with agriculture but it is not just enough to have let's say a, a, a light anthropology course because if we go from the theoretical framing of mainstream microeconomics the question of power the question of interlink markets might take a long time for us to acknowledge to identify and document but from within a political economy framework it's much more easier to uh, acknowledge understand and document interlink markets so in that sense it's not just simply enough to engage with fiction for economists but the theoretical framework that we are exposed to significantly matters so i'm going to uh, discuss two more things and then i'll uh, um, make some concluding remarks now very often uh, the question of savings is still discussed today right? and people i mean even if you look at the economic survey of india sometimes it's argued that we have to increase our savings within the keynesian framework um, which is non mainstream keynes would argue that if you have to increase savings you need to increase investment when investment increases it leads to an increase in aggregate output and employment and that leads to an increase in savings but anyway this is uh, i some kind of a critique of governments or policy makers or economists saying that you know households should save more so let me just leave the uh, read this passage out from shri lal shukla's rag darbari one advertisement said simply save more money most villagers had been told to save money for generations and practically everyone knew about it the only innovation in the advertisement was that it mentioned the nation 
it hinted that if you can't save for yourself then save for the nation the sentiment was just money lenders important officials lawyers and doctors were all saving money for themselves so how could small farmers object to saving for the nation where and how to deposit your money when you had it was also explained clearly in speeches and posters and no one raised any objection to the methods outlined sorry the only thing people were not told was how to get money to save how much money should they be paid for their labor so what becomes very clear here and is that it's one thing to say that okay keep saving but the important question that uh, shila shukla asks in this book is where does this money come from like are wages increasing so that people can save more it's not just enough to keep focusing on saving more or trying to come up with small kinds of innovations or financial innovations which tries to accumulate these savings the more important question even from a political economy point is to point out what determines income and how do we increase the income of uh, agricultural workers in macroeconomics generally remittance income is seen as in a very favorable light right but i thought that uh, in my book what i try to do is just bring in some kind of experiential and contextual information within this larger conceptual discussion that we have in macroeconomics on remittance income because the more remittance income that we get uh, it indicates that this particular con- uh, either we are talking about a particular state which has more resources that it can spend on and Uh, let me read this passage out from sky baba's book vegetarians only the entire community is in the same situation as my family no one chooses to leave suresh there is no joy in leaving behind your loved ones your wife your children your parents and siblings and friends it is especially hard to leave the land of your birth and cross the seven seas to go to a strange foreign land in my community often the entire household depends on the earnings of just one person there are sisters to be married off aged and infirm parents to be taken care of and younger brothers like me who cannot find any decent employment there are so many problems a family faces can't you understand these things do muslims own agricultural land do they have traditional occupations do they have reservations how long do you want us to stick to petty roadside business we eat when we can earn or else we go hungry so again the point of this uh, passage here and the way i use it in my book is we talk about many aggregate uh, measures whether it's saving income remittance income they have to be contextualized within the socio economic background or socio cultural context of the indian economy and either we need to do it in our textbooks or we need to do it both in our textbooks and in our classrooms because only then will we have a better sense of how these theoretical notions relate to the experience of uh, various people within the indian uh, subcontinent so if this is the case then i believe that what i think literature or an engagement with fiction does is the following that it enables us to bring together i think insights or certain kind of key insights Uh, which maybe different disciplines are doing certainly uh, but also understand what our community norms are what the institutional arrangements are what kind of norms or moral sentiments exist within the indian economy now i must also mention here that the indian economy itself is an abstraction it's so what i think literature does is it makes the information and insights much more local and therefore we are able to understand these givens that i've put here in figure uh, 2.1 even better in other words the context becomes even more localized and again i must i mean this is not to say that we should abandon theory or we should abandon empirics and go completely on the side of experience or engagement with fiction what i'm trying to argue here is not that but i i think that it's important that we have a judicious combination of our economics curriculum which deals with theory empirics and experience and even within all these three we should have some kind of pluralism and as i uh, this is an illustration from my book in macroeconomics 
I think that uh, therefore it is important as students of economics and as teachers of economics to some degree that we not only engage with the classics in economics, uh, read the newspapers, ABIA reports, uh, go to the field, read field uh, no notes from the field, engage with history of economic ideas, but it's also important to, I think, engage with local literature and this literature can be in any language. Now, this is the final slide and let me conclude. To understand capitalism uh, as a mode of production, we have various kinds of economic theories, all of which in some way or the other talk about competition. And therefore, it's important to have a conceptual, structural or theoretical understanding of capitalism itself. And it is clear that depending on whether you adopt a political economy framework or whether you adopt a neoclassical microeconomic framework, your understanding of the structure will differ. That's about the theory bit. But then whether it is a political economy framework or a mainstream microeconomic framework, we have to ensure that it makes sense within the local context and what I'm calling Indian capitalism or there might be different kinds of people could come up with different ways of uh, characterizing Indian capitalism. So it could be in the plural where we draw upon uh, these kinds of abstractions and experiential knowledge to talk to further our contextual understanding. And so this can also be improved and strengthened by various kinds of uh, qu quantitative uh, data uh, coming from empirics, but it also has to be, uh, I mean, the experiential part also has to be brought in. In my presentation, what I've tried to argue and try to present to you is that we must also look at fiction as fact. And again, there are different kinds of fiction. This is not to say that uh, all kinds of fiction can be seen as fact, but there are many kinds of writing which can be seen as fact uh, within uh, fiction. Uh, so in a way, I'm, what I'm proposing is that we have either a separate course on fiction for economists or we are able to integrate it within our existing courses as some kind of readings or we are able to bring it into our classrooms through our pedagogy because the local knowledge is extremely important and the i think the advantage of this is that it is not necessary that this local knowledge has to be written in english it is possible for it to be written in bangla or hindi or malayalam as long as we are able to bring those ideas to bear in the classroom and in this manner, I believe that even policy making can be improved because most of policy making has to be localized. And therefore, what works for Bangalore need not work for Calcutta or need not work for Delhi or any other place. So in this manner, we are able to have a better control over our conceptual understanding, our contextual understanding. And therefore, I believe that it will also help us make better economic policies. Thank you. I'll stop here. Yes, thank you, Alex. I really thoroughly enjoyed your lecture. Uh, yes, I mean, I do agree that the way uh, actually in undergraduate economics course, we were taught economics, we had this idea that it's mostly mathematical derivation. We were not introduced to this idea of contextualizing things or understanding the theory in the context. It's, in, I mean, in a much later stage of our life, maybe during PhDs or MPhil, we got to understand what is context, why the theory doesn't work in Indian context and all. So in that regard, uh, your book is a great contribution in that regard. And I would recommend everyone, this is my personal copy, and I, I would recommend everyone, whoever is uh, studying economics or whoever would like to understand economics, you should read Alex's book. It's very lucidly written. And also Alex has, whatever he has presented, he has also referred to this, uh, I mean, about the literature in his book. So thank you. So uh, can we start the Q&A session then? Yeah. So. Joydeep, if you can float the questions here, that will be good. Yeah. So yeah, you have a lot of questions already. OK. Um, OK, you are asking me a very, uh, I mean, I, I don't know if I, I mean, I, I'm the best person or I have any expertise in trying to say that uh, how gender discrimination and caste discrimination can be eliminated. 
but i would say as a teacher the first step is really to acknowledge the issue uh, because very often you know when we are within let's say an economics curriculum how many times do we seriously engage with questions of gender discrimination or caste discrimination and i would say that it is very little unless there are certain courses on like uh, from feminist economics or the economics of discrimination there are some courses in some universities but because micro and macro economics is the is considered to be the most fundamental course that everyone does uh, as a teacher i would think that the way to at least bring it to people's notice first and foremost as a problem as an issue as a social issue is to somehow integrate it within my uh, microeconomics and macroeconomics teaching and so i i would leave it at that because i mean there are many and i don't want to get into the solutions for it because that is not my area of expertise Uh, so some of the things that at least I will just uh, restrict uh, the answer to the question of what is social discrimination uh, to what I have discussed and to some of the things that I have written in my uh, book. Um, one certainly is uh, caste, the other being gender. Uh, in my book, I also talk about uh, religion uh, being another axis. And in, in an international context, we also need to understand that discrimination happens also across or between nationalities. Right? So uh, the fact that uh, a particular group or what we call racism is also a kind of social discrimination. So we can think in multiple axes. So if, for instance, and what this means also is that if, uh, if you are... Um, of a marginalized gender from a marginalized uh, caste in a margin in a country that is developing or marginalized then the discrimination on you is so much more uh, exacerbated so we also i mean what um, academics call intersection that is also something we need to be able to engage and i would say that you know uh, these kinds of questions can come up very easily in a microeconomics, uh, you know, setting because we are talking about determination of wages, we are talking about deter determination of profits, we are talking about competition, and how do these factors play a role in, you know, either not ensuring competition in the first place or not ensuring equilibrium? Uh, we talk about demand and supply curves, um, you know. When there is a high degree of social discrimination across various lines, does it even make sense to you know abstract away from them and then talk about uh, competition? And this is an open question. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that question. So, I mean, I would say that, yeah, you're right that I don't think we can assume uh, fiction as truth, certainly. And just as one is critical of, or one has a critical lens to look at uh, economic theories, economic data, I think a similar kind of lens ought to be used uh, when we are engaging with uh, fiction slash literature. Uh, but I think the way it's so probably also peculiar to the economics discipline, which is now at least largely become uh, super quantitative, partly because of uh, the increased availability of big data, partly because of the ease with which uh, programs can be written, softwares are available and the numbers can be crunched. And the move towards um, quantitative uh, ideas has been fast. There is another reason which I didn't mention in the presentation for, I think, engaging with, uh, you know, literature or uh, fictional narratives uh, for this. One I briefly mentioned, which is that I think fiction, because it doesn't, it is not restricted by a form, it is able to talk about certain things and many things in very many different ways, which can appeal to a large group of people. But the other thing is, and traditionally, uh, or in, in the last few decades, Economics has been largely seen as a mathematical science. Now, I believe that if, as a student, I'm a, or as a person, I want to understand our economic surroundings, 
saying that unless you know advanced calculus or advanced topology uh, you will not be able to understand macroeconomics to me is problematic so i i believe that irrespective of what background we come come from and even if we might not know the most advanced techniques of statistics or mathematics i think with some kind of uh, engagement with narratives of this form we should be able to have meaningful insights about our economic surroundings so in other words uh, i think that there should be a possibility of econo- of students to be able to meaningfully talk about the economy write about the economy even if they are not using advanced mathematics or statistics but just in plain uh, english language or any other language uh okay so the question about folkloristic study so i must acknowledge that i don't know uh, what you mean by that uh, so the way i thought of local knowledge is in the fo- in this limited sense perhaps that uh we have a course on indian economy generally and we think of the indian economy as one entity but what i think fiction and this kind of an engagement with uh, literature helps us realize is that um, there are very specific features like you mentioned geographical uh, it could also be linguistic but also on various social um, backgrounds which have their very unique features and always to at least be mindful of the fact that when we talk of the indian economy we are engaging in a significant level of abstraction from all the complexities and from all the differences that exist within the indian economy and if i mean i also think that most of the policy making has to be decentralized so for a panchayat uh, to be able to make certain decisions i think local knowledge becomes much more relevant of course having a conceptual understanding is important to identify what pieces of local knowledge are important so in that sense i think that um, again it depends on the kind of literature that we are talking about and the kind of literature slash fiction that is written uh, but if they are deeply rooted in a local context it helps us understand that context better Uh, i'm not sure i understand the question but let me just try to respond to it as i understand it uh, and i think that i already mentioned uh, two points so i'll just be brief uh, one is that there is mathematics for economists statistics for economists to be able to make sense of our surroundings and to be able to talk meaningfully about it i think that you can also do it without going through this route of mathematics for economists or statistics for economists so that's one the second is the, there are many kinds of and i've shown a sample of uh, some kinds of writing which very powerfully communicate the experiences of um, their lives which might be coming from very different kind of backgrounds very uh, i mean could be a mix of uh, social social different backgrounds linguistically different backgrounds basically it is about heterogeneity at its core and for any kind of m- theorizing we need to abstract away right so what um, to me fiction is giving me is you know experiences of individuals who are located in their particular local context and on this hand i have theory which is take i mean abstracting away from all that experience and trying to give it a structure but i believe that it is when you bring the two together that we are able to have a much more holistic sense of our economic surroundings uh again so i don't uh, think i mean this is not a question that i would have any again expertise to answer about and uh, i mean i don't think it it is about international uh, rankings or about reputation right? as i write in my book what i believe what policy after all is really about is we want everybody to have a good life so it's not that uh because i am in bangalore i only want people in bangalore to have a good life right uh or because i am an economist i only want economists to have a good life 
or because i am a man i want only men to have a good life so policy in its most broader sense or politics in its most broader sense is to ensure that everybody has a good life and there have been historical inequalities which have to be compensated for uh, so I, to me at least international reputation is of a, you know is not of priority in that context uh, the priority is how do we ensure that everybody has a good life uh okay so again um let me let me try to answer this i don't again i think that there are better people uh, here who can answer this question but a simple kind of uh, maybe example can be you know gender discrimination right so why is it that people who are doing the same job are paid differently now one of the reasons could be that the people who are in power and the people who are making decisions are men uh, and if they think that you know they deserve more for one reason or the other it can happen so the way i would try to understand any kind of discrimination is to think in terms of power what is the kind of structure of power that exists who are the people who are in powerful positions and uh, what kind of decisions are they making and i think that this uh, structure can be understood um, very easily from a political economy sense if i just take it to let's say uh, people in the economy can be broken down into capitalists and workers and marx's insight and many other political economists their insight is very clear that capitalists have more power than workers here it is also important to keep in mind that knowledge production is deeply political over history people have tried to justify why profit should be a certain way people have tried to justify where why there should be more wages so even all these various theories that we talk about often are to you know either support the status quo or question the status quo so even the understanding of discrimination can be seen within the larger uh, politics of knowledge production and i would uh, i would suggest that you try and see it within that larger frame so a remittance income is uh, suppose i go uh, or you go and uh, work in america and your family is here uh, the income that you earn there if you send it back to your family here in india uh, that is called a remittance income and it gets captured in your balance of payments and usually because uh, you know depending on uh, which state you are from for instance kerala because there are many people who have emigrated from kerala and who are working in the gulf and other places uh, kerala economy gets a lot of remittance income uh okay in terms of i i would think that the first thing that we need to do is certainly access to basic resources right and i'm talking including uh, health and education when covid happened it became very clear that our public health system is in shambles uh and this is partly also because there is such wide inequality in our country and people who have resources are able to go and access the private healthcare system and people who have resources do not make demands on the public healthcare system right so there has to be a way i mean either by policy or through some kind of uh, collective movement that we as a community realize that we are interdependent in some sense there is a social aspect to it because after all what the covid virus did in a way is also to indicate that it's not just enough that i mean in the sense the virus uh, affected both rich people and poor people right and similarly if we think of an economic situation also we need to understand that we are interdependent in a structural sense uh, and that we have to improve our public education public health and there has to be i mean proper planning about it too so it's not just enough that uh, we say okay we have to do it but there has to be constant demands that are being made 
And at this juncture, I would also like to highlight that, you know, uh, this is not a debate between markets and government. Because both markets and government are made by people. And people can be discriminatory, whether it's on the lines of caste, gender, or class, or religion. So it's not the case that uh, if it is in the government, these discriminations do not happen, and in the market they happen, or vice versa. So we have to acknowledge these problems, and we have to have ways to uh, ensure that uh, people are treated with respect. Okay, what is the, again, I, I think that the answer would depend on who is responding to it. To me, uh, at least the way I think of it, and because I, in my macroeconomics book also, uh, that's the point that I mentioned, is certainly uh, inadequate wages. Uh, we need to have decent employment which will enable families and individuals to be independent in a way uh, and independent in, to some degree on both, let's say, market processes and also government uh, subsidies. Right? Because it is only in that case that you are able to exercise your autonomy. And then one can discuss how do you want to increase employment? How do you want to improve wages? And both of them would require uh, the government to formulate some kind of strong policies on working conditions, on uh, strengthening maybe the workers' uh, collective bargaining, uh, minimum wages in place, having a better contract law. So to me, uh, because the question of poverty is also connected with the question of employment. Right? So in that sense, I think that good wages and good employment to me are central. And this is the case whether you are in the informal sector, formal sector, whether you are in services sector, agricultural sector, education sector, wherever you are, I think that uh, there has to be strong ways in which we are able to argue for and get better wages, better working conditions and proper stable employment. So uh, the idea of mainstream economics is a historical one. When Adam Smith was writing and Ricardo was writing, their economics was mainstream. Today, uh, we think of mainstream economics as the economics of Marshall, Walras, Pigus, Solo, Samuelson. And these kinds of ideas are found in the textbooks of Mankiw, uh, also in the textbooks of Ahuja and others. They make use of certain kinds of categories like demand and supply, marginal productivity theory, sales law, and all that. Within the alternative framework, there are many varieties. Um, in my book, for instance, I deal with only one thing, which is called classical political economy, along with uh, the work of Michel Kaletsky and Keynes and Srafa. So they have a different understanding of how the economy operates. Although they are trying to explain the same variables, their explanatory categories, their assumptions are completely different. And I'll just give maybe a simple, a small instance of that. In mainstream microeconomic theory, the fundamental unit of analysis is an individual. In political economy, the fundamental unit of analysis is a group or a class. And because your starting points are different and other building blocks are different, the conclusions you arrive at are also very different. Okay, so this is, I mean, it's good that you asked this question because uh, today there are very different kinds of political economy. Now, I think this partly happened after the global financial crisis when people were really angry at economists. So many economists uh, started saying that uh, they do political economy now. And let me just try to tell you that there are different ways people think about it. And the way I am uh, thinking about it and the way I meant it. Uh, some people think of political economy as just coming together of economics and politics. 
right? Uh, well, that's a very lazy way of, I think, thinking about political economy. Or it's one way of thinking about, well, political economy. Let me put it that way. So there are people who do mainstream economics, uh, that is, use neoclassical theory, Mar Marshallian theory, Walrasian theory, and will still claim to do political economy. So uh, that's one kind. The way in which I'm thinking of political economy is in the sense of Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and Karl Marx. Uh, for them, fundamentally, it is about income distribution. Uh, it is the question that you cannot separate out the questions of economics from uh, political aspects. Right? So they are deeply interconnected. And of course, the state has some kind of a role to play also. Right? Uh, because questions of taxation are understood within the larger political economy framework. Uh, so it, when I say political economy, I'm thinking of political economy in the tradition of Smith, Ricardo and Marx. Uh, Uh, I mean, I, I don't know, uh, right? Uh, but it's certainly true that um, if I were to start a guess, that professionalization of disciplines uh, the, and now Americanization of economics has led to a certain kind of narrowing of what is considered to be appropriate sources. Uh, so in that sense, maybe I would say that uh, before this kind of uh, professionalization, before this kind of Americanization of education and marketization of education, uh, you know, wh whether we are trying to get more citation or whatever we are trying to get, I think that people must, would, were more open to various kinds of sources. So this question is easy because I don't know the answer to this at all. Actually, YouTube chat box is flooded with questions. So is it all right if you are like? Yeah. So I, what I'll questions. do maybe now, if there are many more questions, is I will try to uh, respond to the questions that I can respond to. And I mean, yeah. for instance, these kinds of questions, I have no uh, way of, yeah, no real expertise in this. OK. OK, sure. Then Jaydeep, the keep floating the questions or whatever he would like to take. Uh, okay, so I think on this question we need to think about what we mean by interference, right? And whether the interference is of a good kind or a bad kind. And to be able to make that judgment, we need to have some idea of how the economy operates and what determines certain factors and what needs to be done. And let me again give another kind of example. If we go by the traditional demand and supply understanding to wages and the labor market in a very elementary, traditional, basic way, uh, they argue that minimum wages lead to unemployment. Right? I'm just going to state it. I would ask you to go back and look at your microeconomics textbooks because of the way uh, it is structured. Uh, whereas if you come from a more political economy point, uh, and as I argue in my book too, that minimum wages is seen as a beneficial thing. So depending on the theoretical framework you adopt, you might think that this is political interference or that is political interference. So I would say that it really depends on our understanding of various schools of thought. Um, okay, so I'm going to use, uh, maybe go back to Adam Smith here, uh, also because many people think that Adam Smith uh, said that there should be no government and that, you know, markets should entirely be free and both of that is entirely false. Uh, even for somebody like Adam Smith who understood the benefits of market processes, he was very clear that the government has to exist to provide various kinds of services. It one and first and foremost is also to set regulations in place. And how do we go about governing ourselves? 
because again when we think of the government and the market we often have a tendency to think of it as something outside ourselves or something far away from ourselves but in a democratic system at least and because we are always engaging in markets and transactions in one way or the other i believe that it will be more fruitful for us to think of ourselves as being part of the government and as part of the market and then trying to think how can we improve that right and in this context even for smith um, to a large extent he believed that education should be accessible for all and therefore there should be some kind of public education okay this this i don't know the answer uh so this is a i think this is a much a much more broader question so i'm not going to engage too much with it uh, but in my book what i do note is that when we are talking about economics we need to talk about geopolitics of the international kind but that's somewhat still acknowledged but i think that we should also talk about local geopolitics that is within the indian context i think that's also important uh yes i think uh, there are no more questions right joydeepda okay so we have answered mostly all the questions i'm assuming there are no more questions uh, no more so, questions okay okay so it is uh, time officially to provide vote of thanks so on behalf of the department of economics i would like to extend my gratitude to dr alex m thomas for delivering this wonderful talk and the question answer session was actually was a proof that how provocative thought uh, i mean talk he had uh, given here so we are thankful to you alex we are thankful to our, our principal uh, dr moushumi chatterjee and our I icac coordinator dr gautam mukherjee for their cons constant encouragement and support thanks are due to all the participants our students for their patience and enthusiasm throughout the webinar and last but not the least i would like to thank dr joydeep chandra for all the technical assistance so thank you everyone so we are concluding here officially uh, good night thank you